Hey everyone, welcome back to the Majesty of Reason. Today I'm joined by Dr. Kenny Boyce, philosophy professor at the University of Missouri. Our topic is defending nominalism, or at least a particular version of nominalism called fictionalism, against objections, as well as responding to arguments in favor of realism. Don't worry, we'll define these terms eventually. Uh, and also, don't worry, I'm not an anomalist. I know for some of you, that's a cause of concern. Um, but uh, as I've said in, on my channel before, I lean towards some form of realism. Um, but crucial to our search for truth, of course, is um, exposure to and reflection on different perspectives. And I think Kenny is a formidable proponent of nominalism. So uh, yeah, I'm very excited for this. Kenny, thank you for coming on. Thanks, Joe. It's good to be here. I really appreciate the work you're doing on this channel. Uh, it's great to have things like this where people can come learn more about philosophy. Before we get into the conversation, I know you wrote your dissertation defending a version of nominalism called fictionalism. Uh, so can you tell us just briefly about your dissertation and in particular, your dissertation committee, because it's kind of interesting. Yes, yeah, so as you mentioned, my dissertation was a defense of fictionalism about abstract objects, a defense of the denial of Platonism. Uh, and on my committee, well, the interesting thing about my committee is that almost, well, everyone on the committee disagreed with me. Uh, everybody on my committee was, in fact, a Platonist. So on my committee, my director was Michael Ray, and then my committee included Alvin Planiga, Peter Van Inwagen, Jeff Speaks, Megan Sullivan, all Platonists. So I got it from all sides, but it was it was really fun to work with all of them and really good to work with all of them. Nice. Well, unfortunately, you didn't come out of it a Platonist. That's, no, I'm, I'm kidding. But uh, anyway, <laughs> um, Here's it for the audience. Here's the structure of the video. So first, we're just going to be, you know, giving some definitions and kind of giving you a lay of the land of the views on offer. Second, we're going to we're going to be looking at a whole host of objections to fictionalist nominalism, as well as arguments for realism, uh, like ones that are like discussed in professional philosophy journals, as well as ones that you see in more popular presentations. And then finally, we will conclude. Okay, so on to the definitions and the views. So we're just trying to give the audience a sense of the conceptual terrain with respect to abstract objects. So um, as Felipe Leon pointed out in my video with him on uh, atheism and abstracta, characterizing the abstract concrete distinction is, is kind of controversial. I mean, one prominent characterization is that abstract objects are non-causal. They don't stand in causal relations. They don't bring about things causally, whereas concrete objects are causal. Another prominent characterization, of course, is that you know, abstract objects are non-spatiotemporal, whereas concrete objects are spatiotemporal. Now, for me, I find that the most helpful way is just giving a kind of list of paradigmatic examples of abstract objects. So, or excuse me, of abstract and concrete objects. So among, for instance, paradigm concrete objects are going to be like people, particles, planets, trees, universes, Cartesian demons, uh, souls, God, and so on. Uh, of course, if such things exist. Now, as for abstract objects, I thought I'd give just a kind of brief list for people uh, as for the paradigmatic examples. So first we have universals or properties. Now, a universal is something like numerically one thing that's shared in common among numerically distinct things. It's, a, it's an entity that's multiply exemplifiable or multiply instantiable. So um, we're thinking of universals like redness, you know, uh, typically we think that like this cereal box just got cereal on my table because I'm a lowly college student. Um, we got red here and red here. So it's like universal in the sense that it's multiply instantiable both right here and in here. You know, we also have triangularity, humanity, wrongness, goodness, and so on. And we also, under universals, we probably have like natural kinds. So things like water or mammal, things like that. And then finally, relations like taller than or grounds or causes. Now, so that's universals or properties. We also have propositions. These are paradigmatic abstract objects. Philosophers think of propositions as the primary bearers of truth value. Uh, they are the meanings of declarative sentences. They are the objects of propositional attitudes like beliefs and desires and hopes and so on. And examples are things like 
one plus one equals two, like that proposition that I'm expressing. Um, and like mathematical truths, metaphysical truths, and so on. And then just two more paradigmatic examples for the audience. And I'm going to turn it over to Kenny soon. Don't worry. Um, so one is possible worlds. So um, a lot of philosophers think that possible worlds are total or global or complete or maximal ways that reality could be. Uh, and that's sometimes defined as a maximal compossible or maximal consistent collection of propositions. And then um, mathematical objects as well. So these are paradigmatic examples. You got things like sets, uh, numbers, functions, shapes, uh, lines, planes, and so on. So um, do you have anything to add to that characterization, Kenny? No, I, I largely agree with your method of giving paradigmatic examples as a way of characterizing the distinction. As you say, it's hard to come up with a list of non-controversial, necessary, and sufficient conditions, but everybody kind of has a sense, not always totally, they don't always totally agree, but everybody has a rough sense of which goes on one side of the abstract concrete distinction and which goes on the other. I will say that one thing I do assume in my own arguments about abstract objects is that they are in fact a causal or at the very least that they don't causally act on concrete objects. So maybe they're caused to exist by God, but I assume that they don't causally act on anything. Uh, and most Platonists do in fact believe that this is the case and it's Platonist views according to which that's the case that are the targets of my own brand of fictional nominalism. So as we'll find out, my own nominalist views go a bit beyond that, but the fictionalism I defended in my dissertation targets a kind of Platonism according to which abstract objects are a-causal. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so let's now get a sense of the various views on offer here. So we've just kind of characterized the abstract concrete divide and gave the audience kind of paradigmatic examples of concrete and abstract <laughs> objects. So now let's talk about the different views. So we can broadly distinguish between like realist and anti-realist views. So realist views say that abstract objects exist. Uh, Anti-realist views say that abstract objects don't exist. Uh, and of course, one need not be a realist about all different kinds of abstract, you know, may, maybe one thinks that there are properties or universals, but there are no propositions. Uh, and maybe uh, there are no abstract, or there are no mathematical objects. So um, you don't have to be a realist about absolutely every single kind of abstract, uh, of purportedly abstract object. And so while we can't hope to be exhaustive here, uh, both in terms of the total range of views on offer, as well as the nuances of each view. Um, Kenny, can you just briefly kind of explain the following views for us? And I'll let you do the kind of taxonomy. Okay, sure. Um, so there's Platonism, which I'll characterize as the view that there are abstract entities of some sort and that they are non-spatiotemporal, a-causal objects. There's also Aristotelianism. So Aristotelians distinguish themselves from Platonists when, they, when it comes to what they think about properties. So unlike Platonists who believe that properties are a causal abstract entities that aren't spatiotemporally located, Aristotelians believe that properties are spatially temporally located and that they inhere in the things that have them. So it's water bottles, blue, purplish, let's say it's blue. Um, and so uh, an Aristotelian might say, you know, the blueness is actually located here. It adheres in this thing. Perhaps I'm literally seeing the blueness of this water bottle. So an Aristotelian might affirm that I can literally see colors, whereas a Platonist would deny that I can literally see colors because on a Platonist view, as I am characterizing it, colors are non-spatiotemporal. They're not located. Uh, they're, they're not causally interacting with me. Um, it is also possible to have a hybrid view here. So David Lewis suggests a hybrid view according to which one might believe in Aristotelian universals and Platonic properties. And we'll see what the potential advantages of that view, or we might see what the potential advantages of that view is later on in the discussion, but it's good to note that there could be a hybrid like that. Um, there's also conceptualism. So some people think that our talk about abstract entities is really about, or at least could be replaced with talk of mental entities, uh, namely concepts. You could identify those concepts with human concepts, or you could identify them as some theists do with divine concepts. Um, 
There are also, okay, so those are the, those are the kinds which you, which you would want to classify as realist views. Um, do you want me to go ahead and go on and discuss anti-realist views, or do you want to pause here for a second? Yeah, no, that's good. I, I think that was good. So anti-realist views. So nominalism, that's a term we're going to be tossing around a bit. And nominalism is actually, the word nominal is actually used to denote a couple of different theses. So sometimes nominalism is used to denote the thesis that there are no universals, that there are no uh, multiply instantiable entities, that there are no properties. Um, sometimes nominalism is used to denote the view that there are no abstract objects. And these theses, they're not, they're not equivalent. So I am a nominalist in both senses. I deny that there are entities such as universals and that there are abstract objects, but some are nominalists merely about universals, but they're completely comfortable with believing in certain kinds of abstract objects, such, such as sets. There are a number of nominalists about universals who are comfortable with believing in sets and might even use sets to help defend their nominalism about universals. They might suggest, for example, that instead of talking about the universal redness, we could just talk about the set of red things. Um, in the other direction, a certain sort of Aristotelian might say uh, that, or they, they, they might deny that there are abstract objects because they believe in universals, but they think that they're spatiotemporally located and that they cause things. So they might deny on those grounds that they should be classified as abstract. And then they might go on to deny that there are abstract objects. So that shows how these theses can come apart from each other, but sometimes they get lumped together because they both get called nominalism. Um, so as I said, I personally deny that there are universals and that there are abstract objects. My fictionalist views though target uh, merely the claim that there are abstract objects conceived of as a causal and non-spatiotemporal. So I'll, I'll, I'm willing to talk with you about how I resist arguments for universals more generally later on, but that's what my fictionalist view is targeting. Um, I think, some of the details of my fictionalist view will continue to emerge in the discussion, but just to kind of give your viewers a sense, a rough sense of where I'm coming from, I believe that there are no abstract entities. However, I am willing to concede to the Platonist that we can't avoid talking and reasoning as if there are such entities. But I believe that our being forced to talk and reason that way is really just a product of our own cognitive and epistemic limitations. And that by itself is not a good reason to believe that these entities exist. So I think we could continue to go on talking this way, but regard it as a kind of pretense. We could just pretend that there are these entities and that they stand in certain sorts of relations to call the concrete objects and then go on happily talking as if there are such, such entities. So views similar to mine have been articulated, though not in all of these cases endorsed by philosophers such as Mark Bolliger, Mary Lang, Joseph Melia, Gideon Rosen, and Stephen Yablo. Ramapi is also sympathetic to it. Oh, okay. Well, mm -hmm. that makes me feel even better. <laughs> uh, <laughs> There's good. There, there's a lot of good company for this view. I think. Um, you know, I should also mention that in the in the literature, people sometimes distinguish between hermeneutic fictionalism and revolutionary fictional fictionalism. So, hermeneutic fictionalism is a thesis about what people are actually doing when they talk as though there there are abstract objects, that they're actually pretending, uh, they're engaged in a kind of pretense. I I. I find that implausible. I find it implausible that that's what people are actually doing. Um, although I'm sympathetic to a view that Maddie Eklund calls indifferentism, which is that in most contexts, the folk are simply indifferent concerning the ontological presuppositions of their talk. 
So they might presuppose for conversational purposes that there are abstract entities, but they're indifferent to whether those presuppositions are really true. And my view is be, uh, following Eklund, following Peter Van Inwagen, uh, is that often the folk, when they talk as though there are, there are certain kinds of controversial entities, they're, their talk is actually neutral with respect to the philosophical questions that we're uh, asking. But in any case, my own kind of fictionalism doesn't depend on any hermeneutic thesis being true. It's closer to what's sometimes called revolutionary fictionalism, which is the view that uh, insofar as we do, we do commit ourselves to the existence of abstract entities through our manner of talking, we should stop talking that way and take up a pretense attitude instead. Although I, I also am not trying to give any prescriptions here to the folk. What's really important for my view is that in principle, we could replace our talk about abstract entities with a kind of practice of pretense without any significant practical or theoretical loss. Just for the audience, they probably already kind of have an intuitive sense of it, but can you just run down like what is pretense? Like what what, what is that? Like what is, just give it for the audience. Yeah, so if you and I were talking about the Lord of the Rings, for example, we might say, well, why did they walk all the way to Mordor? Why didn't, you know, why didn't they just have the eagles fly them over there and um, we might, we, we might, we might talk as though Frodo and Sam and Gollum, that these were all real, uh, creatures and that the, the, we would talk as though these are real events. We just slip into that quite naturally. And then if an outsider came along and said, well, you, you really believe in things like wizards and hobbits and things like that, we'd say, no, 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 no. We're just talking as though the Lord of the, the Rings fiction is true. We could think of the Lord of the Rings text is giving us the kind of, this is following Kendall Walton's view of, of fiction. We can consider them as kind of props that set up this game of pretense and their rules of generation that take us from what's true about these props to claims that are licensed by the pretense, claims that are true according to the pretense. So the suggestion here is that we could think of talk as though they're abstract objects is very similar to talk as though there are, kind, are things like wizards and hobbits. We can have this kind of fiction that has its own pretense, its own or its its own rules of generation, its own things that are true according to that pretense. And in this case, it would be um, what uh, Kendall Walton calls prop-oriented make-believe. So when we're talking about the Lord of the Rings, we kind of want to forget about the props. We want to immerse ourselves in the world. But sometimes some fiction, fictional some fictions, the sake of engaging in the fiction is to learn more about the props. So we might pretend, for example, that Italy is a boot for the sake of navigating around Italy. Oh, you need to go down to the heel if you want to get there. Um, there, we're not really interested in the content of the fiction itself. We're interested in engaging with that content because of what it can tell us about the geography of Italy. So likewise, the Platonist fiction would be a kind of prop-oriented sort of make-believe. All right, that makes sense. And I mean, one important thing to see there is that, you know, when we are in this kind of um, make-believe frame of mind, you know, we're, when we say that there is, there is a, a super magical power that Harry Potter used, or Harry Potter cast a spell on this other person, we aren't ontologically committing ourselves to the existence of spells and magical powers and so on. So that's important for the audience to see uh, because um, if Kenny were to say things, as we're gonna talk about, if you were to say things like one plus one equals two without the kind of pretense behind it, um, arguably he would be committing himself to these kinds of abstract objects like the number one, the number two, the plus function, um, but he avoids that by means of uh, the pretense. So I just wanted to get that for the audience as well. That's good. Okay, so now let's, we've characterized the views and now let's move on to the spicy objections to fictionalist nominalism, as well as arguments for realism. So we're kind of just mushing them together because an argument for realism is uh, a fortiori an argument against uh, fictionalist nominalism. So yeah, we're just gonna go through a bunch of different um, 
bunch of different such arguments. So the first, uh, I've grouped them into classes for the audience, and you can follow like the chapters. I'll have the the timestamps and so on for different chapters of what we're talking about for the objections. So first, we're going to be covering one over many arguments, and there are many such arguments. So um, many particulars are alike in various ways. They resemble one another. Um, for instance, like photons are hitting my eyes right now, uh, your eyes right now, and the viewer's eyes right now. Uh, and they all have the same charge, namely zero, uh, the same spin, the same speed, and so on. Um, and they all seem to have the same causal powers and dispositions. Uh, or consider my black phone and my black water bottle uh, and so on, right? These seem to objectively resemble one another. This is a, a, you know, this is just a datum of ordinary experience. And this is, I take it, is the, the kind of basic observation that forms the bedrock of one over many arguments. And, you know, the basic idea is intuitive enough. I mean, if the photons are same in respect of their speed and mass and so on, um, doesn't it follow that there are respects in which they're the same? And doesn't that commit us to properties or features or universals or whatever else we want to call them that they share in common? So um, can you just take us through this kind of basic intuition behind it? Yeah, let's look at an argument. Um, so let's take the, let's take a case of a shared color. So We'll, we'll assume that there's this apple and this fire hydrant, and they're both red. So premise one, the apple and the fire hydrant are both red, stipulating that that's true for the sake of the example. Premise two, if the apple and the fire hydrant are both red, then there is something they both share, namely redness. Premise three, if there is something that the apple and the fire hydrant both share, namely redness, then there is such a thing as redness. Conclusion, therefore, there is such a thing as redness. Now, where I get off the train on that argument is at premise two. So I agree that the apple and the fire hydrant are both red. I regard the claim that the apple and the fire uh, hydrant are both red as equivalent to the conjunctive claim that the apple is red and the fire hydrant is red. But I deny that it follows from this conjunctive claim that there's some entity in addition to the red apple and the red fire hydrant namely redness. And so I deny uh, that there is any color that they have in common. Now, I do agree though, that in ordinary discourse and often even in philosophical discourse, learning that the apple is red and that the fire hydrant is red licenses us to talk as though there is something that they share in common, namely redness. But in my view, such talk is licensed in a similar sort of way that say, rolling a natural 20 when playing D&D might license the claim that I landed a critical hit. Uh, the pretense is governed by certain rules that license that claim under those conditions. Likewise, I think when we're engaged in the pretense surrounding property talk, when A is F and B is F, we're licensed in asserting that uh, there's something A and B have in common, namely the property of being F, or at least that's a rough rule of thumb can't take it too far, you'll run into Russell's paradoxes, but that's the rough rule of thumb that governs our pretense. Yeah. Okay. So again, that was just the kind of the basic idea behind one over many arguments. So now we're going to, I don't know, maybe try to probe some more specific kinds of versions. Mm -hmm. So um, one version of this is an inference to the best or perhaps only explanation. So we can ask uh, what explains objective resemblance or similarity or apparent commonality? Well, here's an illuminating explanation. Uh, in each case of resemblance, there is some one thing that's shared in common among the particulars. Uh, since everything resembles itself, we have a neat explanation here of resemblance. Things resemble because they literally share one and the same thing in common among themselves. That, of course, gives an illuminating account or explanation as to why they objectively resemble. But if there's literally nothing that they share in common, their resemblance would seem to be inexplicable. Uh, and even if it were explicable, surely the most illuminating explanation available, the one that explains the widest array of phenomena under a unified schema, and namely the schema that X examples Y, X resembles Y in respect F because there exists an F such that X and Y each instantiate F. The best explanation is surely one that explains the widest array of phenomena under that unified schema in a satisfying way. Um, and, and so what do you kind of make of this? Well, actually, let, let me, let me, well, let me continue because nominalists 
they, you know, what realists will say is that nominalists might actually seem unable to explain this at all. Um, where we think that there are universals, the nominalists may say there are really only predicates. You know, might, there might be just words that we apply to many things. Uh, but of course, uh, predicates, they, they themselves seem to be affirming the existence of universals. Like we have one and the same predicate and I use the predicate, use the predicate, other things. So it seems to be one thing shared in common among a variety of things. And then uh, just finally, uh, I just want to bring in something that uh, my own professor, Jeff Brower, um, what he says, he says, as realists point out, when the members of some class objectively resemble one another in some respect, they seem to form a special sort of class, what are often called natural classes or kinds. Unlike mere class membership, which can result from any arbitrary grouping or collection, kind membership is something that seems to cry out for explanation. For insofar as the members of some class objectively resemble one another and hence form a kind, they seem to possess a special sort of unity, one that is both lacking in the case of mere classes and is naturally explained in terms of a universal. Indeed, it is precisely for this reason that realists often insist that there is a universal shared in common by the members of the class of blue or green things, but not by the members of Goodman's famous class of Gru things, that is, things which are either green before some future time t or blue thereafter. For, unlike blue or green things, Gru things do not form a kind. So what do you make of this kind of explanatory argument from objective resemblance? Okay, good. So I think there are at least three related phenomena here that one might potentially want to explain. So first, there's just character having itself. That is, we have a case where A is F, you know, the apple's red, the, the grass is green, whatever. Uh, we have a case where A is F, and we can ask, well, why is it the case that A has the character of being F? So second, there's resemblance in certain respects. So A and B are both F. We can ask, why is it the case that they resemble each other with respect to being F? And then finally, there's natural resemblance full stop. So two electrons don't merely resemble each other in certain respects. They just, they just resemble each other, uh, period. Um, so when it comes to these phenomena, my, my own preference when it comes to character having is to take that as primitive. So whereas the realist might offer to explain why A is F via its exemplifying Fness, I think the fact that A is F is just fine as it is and not in need of any distinctive sort of metaphysical explanation. So explanations have to stop somewhere. They run out at some point. And I don't really see how the realist's explanation of character having gives us much of an explanatory advantage here. So the, the realist will explain the fact that A is F in terms of its exemplifying Fness. But then we ask, well, why does it exemplify Fness? And then the realist will most likely say, well, that's just a brute fact. That's where we stop. And if that's what the realist says, I want to know why not just stop one step earlier than that. So I'll happily accept a view that sometimes been disparagingly called ostrich nominalism. So ask me for an explanation of character having that I will, from the realist perspective, just stick my head in the sand and deny that I need to give one. I'll just accept it as brute. But now if I have character having as brute, I can explain ex resemblance in certain respects in terms of it. So why is it that A resemble one another with respect to being F? Well, it's simple. They're both F. End of story. That's, I think that's all I need to say. Now, where I might get tripped up a little bit is with respect to natural resemblance, full stop. So as Jeff Brower says, um, as others have pointed out, some things just seem to go together, objectively speaking, in ways that others don't. So Ted Sider gives the example, you, you could have two electrons, they just go together or you could have an electron and a cow, they don't go together in the same way that the two electrons go together. And this going together can't really be explained in terms of resemblance in certain respects. And the reason why it can't be explained in that way is that any two things resemble each other in infinitely many respects and fail to resemble each other also in infinitely many respects. So take the electron and the cow, they both resemble each other in the respect of not being identical to the number one. 
and they both resemble each other in the respect of not being identical to the number two and so on. Uh, take the two electrons. So at the very least, they differ with respect to identity. But once we identify that difference, we can get infinitely many more. So they're not similar with the respect of being identical to E1 or the number one, or not similar in the respect of being identical to E1 or the number two, and so on. So uh, this issue, it's this issue of not being able to explain resemblance full stop in terms of resemblance in certain respects is one that even haunts certain kinds of realists. So take a Platonist view of properties, for example, according to which properties are what they're sometimes described as abundant. That is, on this view, for pretty much any meaningful predicate, barring certain paradoxical cases, uh, there's a corresponding property. So on that view too, the, the cow and the electron share infinitely many properties with each other, and the two electrons also differ with respect to infinitely many properties. So the mere sharing of properties on this view can't account for natural resemblance, full stop. Now, what the Platonists might want to do here is suggest that certain properties form a privileged class. So some shared properties like being red or not red, for instance, don't really make for uh, natural resemblance, full stop. But other properties like the property of being an electron do make for natural resemblance full stop. But a parallel move is also available to the nominalist. Instead of saying, for instance, that sharing the property of being an electron contributes to natural resemblance full stop, the nominalist can just say that two things, both being electrons, makes for natural resemblance between them. Um, on either view, if we ask, well, why is it those properties or those predicates that correspond to the natural resemblances? The answer is, well, they just do. End of story. Now, maybe one realist view with a genuine advantage here is Aristotelianism about universals, because Aristotelians typically think that universals are sparse. That is, they don't just think that any predicate corresponds to a universal, but only certain special ones, the ones that tend to naturally pick out resembling things. So predicates like is an electron. And furthermore, you know, these, are, these universals are thought to inhere in the things that have them uh, in some metaphorical sense, often they're thought of as part of the being of those things. Uh, and uh, it's the sharing of these universals that makes for natural resemblance. Now, David Lewis suggests that Platonist who believes in abundant abstract properties, they could add Aristotelian universals to their ontology in order to explain why some of the properties correspond to natural resemblances and some don't. The ones that correspond to natural resemblances would be the ones that have Aristotelian universals as counterparts. Um, now, you know, as I mentioned uh, before, Aristotelian universals so conceived, they're not really abstract objects given my classification scheme at least because they're not taken to be causally inert. So technically, you could embrace my own brand of fictionalism about abstract objects like numbers and sets while also believing in Aristotelian universals. That's an option on the table. Now, that's not an option I take. I don't believe in Aristotelian universals. Why not? Well, I grant that by refusing to add them to my ontology, I might have to take as brute some things that I could otherwise explain, such as why some predicates but not others correspond to natural resemblances. But they're weird. <laughs> the price tag of having that explanation is that I'd have to add them to my ontology and I have to believe in such strange entities. And I think that's a cost. And I just, I know some people will weigh these costs and benefits differently, but when I weigh them, I just, I, it's not quite enough to make me want to pay. Yeah, there, there are a number of things that I kind of want to comment on here. I mean, one thing is that um, I think a lot of, or at least from what I can tell, aren't there many Platonists who also kind of reject at least some of these like arguments from like the one over many arguments? Because for instance, you have character grounding views where properties ground character or the universals ground character. So it's because something has the property of being read that it's read, but that's one set of views, but a lot of other Platonists 
have what we could call anti-character grounding views where uh, no, it's the other way around. It's because something is red that it has the property of being red or things along those lines. Um, I think like William Lane Craig uses the example of a dog and, and being brown. It's like, it's not because the dog instantiates the universal brownness that it is brown rather. Um, well, no, instantiate, excuse me, it instantiates the property of being round or brown because it is brown because it's brown. It's not brown because it instantiates the property of being brown. And I know um, Peter Van Inwagen, for instance, holds the anti-character mm -hmm. grounding view. Um, so like even many Platonists, I just want to get this on the audience's radar, don't accept some of these uh, inference to the best explanation arguments for the existence of universals. So that's one thing that I wanted to say. Um, and I guess I'll make one other point and I'll turn it over to you for comments. Um, is that, like you said at the end there, we have to do this trade-off between simplicity and explanatory breadth and depth. So even if you granted that um, realist views have an explanatory advantage with respect to um, those three kind of questions that you demarcated, even if that's the case, you still have to take into account the cost that you get in terms of uh, postulating this additional category or kind of thing in your ontology, this fundamental category kind of thing. Um, arguably, you're adding infinitely many such things into your ontology. Um, arguably, um, you have to have a whole lot of new primitive vocabulary uh, that, that's describing these sorts of things. You just have to add a lot of stuff that's going to be primitive. Um, and it's just a lot of ontological costs in many nominalists' minds. So, those are some things that I just wanted to say uh, in that regard. And I'll, I'll, if you have any comments on that. Yeah, I think those are both good points. So one, I guess not a substantive point, but one thing I wanna point out about the anti-character grounding views, the anti-character grounding Platonist views is I like a term that's sometimes used for them. They, they're sometimes called ostrich plate, Platonists because like the ostrich nominalists, they don't attempt to explain character grounding. They take that as brute, and then they explain why certain things exemplify pro certain properties in terms of the character of those things. So I may use that term as we continue to talk. If I talk about ostrich Platonism, I'm talking about anti-character grounding versions of Platonism. And second, yeah, the point you make about the trade-off uh, is exactly right. And I would emphasize that once we add new things into our ontology, we sometimes have other explanatory questions to ask about those things. So it's not always clear that we're gaining an, a, an overall explanatory advantage by adding them to our ontology. We may just get other questions. And then at a certain point, we, we have to stop at some place that's brute. And so we can disagree about just where to stop, but everybody has to accept their, their brute facts. Everybody has to have their primitives. Yeah. And it's interesting that you point out that um, like a lot of times when you start explaining by postulation, um, in this case, postulating abstracta and in particular universals, um, it does kind of sometimes it raises you, it raises all these new puzzles that you have to go through uh, and new questions, new difficulties, new puzzles. And it's like, it's not clear that you are even like, like you solved one problem by bringing in 30 more it's potentially, yeah, right. potentially. That's what a lot of anomalists think. I mean, for instance, I know um, David, uh, I've read, Trenton Merrick's told me how to pronounce it. Um, it's David Builes, not, not Biles, but Builes, B-U-I-L-E-S. He's got some interesting recent papers arguing for nominalism. Uh, and he uses, well, one of, one of the appeals that he uses is like arbitrariness considerations. So like um, he, he particularly looks at mathematical Platonism and, you know, like given, uh, given certain tenets or theses that many mathematical Platonists themselves accept. Um, and I know also, um, what is it, Christopher Menzel in, in his, uh, in his entry in the uh, two dozen or so arguments for God's existence, like the set theoretic hierarchy, like there's a set theoretic hierarchy and you can build and build and build and build. And like, you can prove that it has to actually cut off somewhere. Um, but it, it seems to be just arbitrary where it cuts off. Cause you could always just have the power set of whatever the things you, that you had, you know, you could always form more and more sets it seems, but you can actually prove that it's actually gonna have to come to an end somewhere. Um, this kind of iterative hierarchy and 
it just seems arbitrary. Like, why would it cut off at that particular place? Uh, it's just so, it's really odd. And, and you know, you get into this stuff about um, numbers and, you know, like uh, cardinalities and so on, like it's just infinities upon infinities upon infinities. You get like Aleph null, oh wait, Aleph one. And then you go, 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 go all through those. And it's like even more, I don't know. You, you think about it and just, it raises, potentially it raises more questions than it does solve by postulating them. So that's one thing to keep in mind for the audience. Um, and uh, yeah. Yeah, good. And I, I guess I just want to point out uh, that fictionalism has a nice advantage here because stories can include gaps. They can include details that aren't filled in. And so when it comes to these kinds of arbitrary stopping points, we could just imagine that the story is incomplete uh, with re with, in that respect. And so there may be no fact of the matter according to the fiction where things cut off. And that seems to me more intuitively correct than the idea that there's some actual arbitrary cutoff. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, so let's move on to another kind of way to push the one over many argument. So like some nominalists are led to say in response to these one over many arguments that things just resemble each other. And you know, that's that, you know, there's no further story to tell or account to give. Um, but Bertrand Russell famously argued that this seems to lead to a vicious regress, or at least it seems to surreptitiously bring back in uh, universals after all, uh, because this resemblance itself to which the nominalist here appeals seems to be a universal, right? A stop sign resembles a fire truck, which is why we call them both red. Uh, snow and polar bears resemble, uh, which is why we call them both white and so on. So we have a bunch of these different resemblances. Um, but in that case, where you seem to be appealing to multiple instances of one and the same universal, namely resemblance. Um, and of course, if the nominalist just says, oh, those resemble each other, you know, we're, we're off on another regress because um, we have a bunch of those different cases of these higher order resemblance relations and so on, um, if we can call them relations. So what do you make of this kind of Russellian vicious regress argument? Okay, yeah. So. In my previous response, I listed these three phenomena, character having resemblance in certain respects and natural resemblance full stop. I propose that we take character having as brute, analyze resemblance in certain respects in terms of character having, and then also, you know, more or less take natural resemblance full stop as brute. But resemblance nominalists will say that I'm not being ambitious enough here. They'll say I could take natural resemblance full stop as primitive, and then analyze character having in terms of it. And a really very rough first sketch of the idea, really it's just kind of a programmatic slogan to be carried out, might be, you know, what makes something F is the fact that it's one of a certain class of resembling things. So what makes something red is the fact that it resembles all these other, all these other things in the right sorts of ways. And you have to impose other conditions to make it work out. Like I said, it's a programmatic statement of the view. And there are lots of technical difficulties to be worked out with such anomalous program. But I, and I think most philosophers agree that Russell's objection against it doesn't really work precisely because the resemblance nominalist program takes resemblance as primitive. They don't try to explain resemblance in terms of positing a universal, that's their primitive. And so, uh, we don't get any such thing as the universal of resemblance. And so the regress never even gets started. It never even gets off the ground. Now, the objection to resemblance nominalism that I, and I suspect most other philosophers would find most moving isn't really Russell's, but uh, the fact that it seems to get the order of explanation backwards. So the, the fact that two electrons perfectly resemble one another, it seems to me, has something to do with the fact that they're both electrons, mm -hmm. rather than it's being the case that they're both electrons because they resemble each other. So it seems like resemblance ought to be explained in terms of character having rather than the other way around. Yeah, I, I, I definitely agree with that. So, uh, and it, it's interesting to see, so for the audience, just note that, um, an objection to one kind of nominalism is not necessarily going to be objection, an objection to a different kind of nominalism. You have resemblance nominalists that Kenny was just talking about, but not all nominalists are resemblance nominalists. So if someone claims to have uh, like a knockdown argument against 
nominalism say, but it might just be targeting a particular brand or version of nominalism. It's kind of similar to theism. One might think that one has a knockdown argument against a particular model or conception or version of God, but that doesn't mean it's an argument against God's existence. There might be other models or versions out there. Um, so, you know, someone might argue against Molinism uh, and, you know, but it won't follow from that, of course, that God doesn't exist. Uh, if their argument succeeds, all it would show is just that, well, Molinism can't be true. There might be another model of God where some non-Molinist view is true. So anyway, that's just for the audience to keep in mind their critical thinking tool toolkit. So here's another thing. This is kind of a cheeky argument, but um, I see colors. Uh, and colors are properties. Uh, I can distinguish red from blue, for instance, and I, but I can't distinguish. Here's something that I can't distinguish. I can't distinguish one nothing from another nothing. So I can distinguish red from blue, uh, but I can't distinguish one nothing from another nothing. So it seems as, seems as though there is such a thing as red and there is such a thing as blue, and what else would those be but properties? So um, what do you think of this cheeky argument? Is it too cheeky? Well, it's not too cheeky. It's it's an argument. It's got premises, but I'll, I, I just deny that you see colors. So uh, I think you see red objects and blue objects, and you can distinguish red objects from blue objects. But I deny that you actually see redness and blueness. And I want to point out that it's not just a nominalist like me who will deny that you can see colors. Platonists who think of colors as these causally inert abstract entities outside of space time will also deny that you see them. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, that's another thing, like an argument against a particular version of nominalism might also be an argument against some versions of realism. So people need to be aware of that. Okay, so finally, I think this is the last argument that we're gonna be considering in the one over many type um, arguments. Uh, some have argued that nominalists simply cannot explain the formal features of exact resemblance. And these formal features that I'm thinking of are reflexivity, sym symmetry, and transitivity. So just for the audience, I want to say a relation, although you don't believe that there are relations, but I'll just, I'll go with it, okay? It's part of the fiction. <laughs> so that's um, right. That's fine. A, a yeah, a relation is reflexive um, just in case it uh, something that instantiates it, ha like it stands in that relation to itself. So for instance, being identical to, that is a reflexive relation because everything is self-identical. So it's like, X stands in that relation to X itself. That's basically the, the, the recipe for re reflexivity. Second, we have symmetry, okay? So that means that if X stands in that relation to Y, well then Y is also gonna be standing in that relation to X. So um, we have X R Y, and we also have Y R X. So Y standing in that relation to X, X is also standing in that relation to Y. So if X is identical to Y, well then obviously Y is identical to X, right? So transitivity, that just means that um, X, if X stands in the relation to Y and Y stands in that relation to Z, well then X stands in that relation to Z. So we have X R Y, we also have Y R Z, and from that we get X R Z. So X stands in that relation to Z. So for instance, taller than, right? If I'm taller than someone else and that person is taller than Fred, well then I'm taller than Fred. Now let's go back to these formal features. So we have reflexivity, symmetry, and transitivity. And the, ba the basic objection here is that nominalists can't explain the formal features of exact resemblance, these three in particular. If there's one and the same thing that's shared in common among different particulars, well then such formal features, of course, make perfect sense. Um, to put things very roughly, uh, if exact resemblance requires one and the same feature shared in common, well, then we can explain the equivalence relationhood. So an equivalence relation is just anything that has those three characteristics, reflexivity, symmetry, and transitivity. So we can explain the equivalence relationhood of exact resemblance in terms of the equivalence relationhood of one and the same feature as. Um, but by contrast, if the things in question don't share one thing in common, well, then the fact that exact resemblance is an equivalence relation, that would seem to be unexplained. So what do you make of this line of thinking? Yeah, so believe it or not, this is actually one of the arguments for belief in universals that I find the most forceful personally. But I think the fictionalists can offer a kind of explanation here too. Now, putting that explanation on the table does require a little bit of setup. So Mary Lang, in the context of defending fictionalism about mathematics, notes that scientific explanations often appeal to ideal objects. So one might explain the behavior of a real gas, for example, by citing certain analogies between it and an ideal gas. 
But as Lang points out, one doesn't need to believe that uh, ideal gases actually exist in order to put forward such explanations. It's enough that the character of the real gas makes it suited to stand in such analogous relations to an ideal gas, regardless of whether there are actually any ideal gases. So just keep that thought in the back of your mind. Now consider what ostrich plateness, anti-grounding, anti-character grounding plateness might have to say about this argument. I think they too could explain the formal properties of resemblance. Um, so they could say that what it is for two things to exactly intrinsically resemble one another is to share all and only the same properties. Or they could, let me, not what it is to do that, but they could say necessarily if two things exactly intrinsically resemble each other, they share all and only the same properties. But they'll deny that the character of those two things is to be explained in terms of them, they're having those properties. They'd say it's the other way around. But still, since necessarily, if two things exactly intrinsically resemble each other, they share all and only the same properties and sharing all and only the same properties is an equivalence relation. It follows that exact intrinsic resemblance is an equivalence relation. And so we get a kind of explanation for that. Um, so now take the fictionalists. The fictionalists, I think, can mirror the ostrich plateness explanation here in the manner of a scientist appealing to ideal gases. So the fictionalists can say, it's not really true that when two things exactly intrinsically resemble each other, they share all and only the same intrinsic properties. However, the character of those things make it so that it's true according to the plateness fiction that they share all and only the same intrinsic properties. And since, since the Platonist fiction is taken to be closed under analytic entailment, this in turn entails that exact intrinsic resemblance is an equivalence relation. And as in the case of ideal gases, what really matters for the explanation is not really that the two entities in question do in fact stand in the relation of sharing all and only the same properties but that their characters make them suited to do so. So it sounds like cheating without bringing in that, that last part. So like, it's not as though we are appealing to something fictional to explain it. I mean, that's part of the explanation, but we tie it back to reality, right? It's it, the character of the particulars mm -hmm. is such that it makes it suitable, right? Um, so that's that's kind of like the, because. You know, I don't like explaining things by appeal to like non-existent uh, fictions and so on. So it's like, as long as you can tie it back to, so how is that kind of making suitable? Can you just spell that out for us? Like, how does it that like the particulars make this kind of, um, this fictional talk about their sharing all and only the same intrinsic properties, how does it make it suitable? Is that just kind of going back to the, um, the primitive aspect that you had? Like, well, I don't know, I'll, I'll turn it over to you. Let's go back to the, the scientific analogy just for a second, just, just to get that before our mind. So I think most people are going to agree, I hope, in your audience at least, that you know, we in science we can explain certain phenomena by saying that they're an analogous to things like ideal gases or frictionless planes or whatever. Uh, we can hold that um, we can hold that these explanations work even if there are no such things as ideal gases or um, frictionless planes, because we take ourselves to be somehow illuminating something about the character of the real things by citing their suitability to stand in these analogies or in these analogous relations. So I take it that we do illuminate something about the nature of character having and intrinsic resemblance by uh, by explain or by saying how the character of these things makes them suited to make true these certain claims in the fiction. Um, and I don't know, like, can I, are, I, I'm not quite sure what you're asking for. You ask, you're, you're asking for an explanation of 
how the character of those things makes them suited to do that. I don't know if yeah, I can like, give is, you is an explanation. <laughs> I, feel yeah, like... I don't know if I can. I don't know if I can give you an explanation for that. I think it's more along the lines of I, I am illuminating something about the nature of character having by um, noting that things having this character may would make them suited to stand in in these kinds of relations of um, being exemplified by properties if something like Platonism were true. Yeah. I think I, I think I am illuminating something about their character. And I think that that illumination does generate some understanding. And so I think for that reason, it's explanatory. But I yeah. don't think I can press the explanatory story much deeper than that. Okay. I will yeah, see that. What, yeah. Like what I was thinking is like, um, and I probably, I should have spelled this out. What I was thinking is like in the case of um, what frictionless planes and the, in the case of ideal gases, like I can specify the respects in which uh, like the real gases that we actually have are like relevantly similar to uh, what ideal gases would be like were they to exist, you know? Like, yeah, sure, they, we don't have perfectly, we don't have perfectly elastic collisions in real life, but it's like, I can tell you, I can like, I could do all this math and show you that it's like pretty damn close to perfectly elastic. Um, and I can also, you know, of course they're not point sized particles, which I believe that's what you have to have in an ideal gas, something like that. Um, but, uh, you know, of course, real gases are not point sized particles, but they're super duper small. And um, that is at least somewhat of an approximation to point sizedness. Um, so it's like, I can kind of spell out the respects in which uh, talking about ideal gases here is at least suitable and can be illuminating. So I can I can give a kind of explanation of why um, appeals to mm -hmm. ideal gases and so on are illuminating. Um, same with frictionless planes. Like I can explain features of um, the surface. Uh, you know, it's really flat. You know, we don't. It's it's not it's not made out of such and such um, uh, like rubber or any other sorts of materials that would have certain properties that, or certain features that would make it stop uh, whatever's going on it and so on. So it's like, I can kind of explain why there's this suitability here, but I'm not sure if there's that relevant similarity in your case. Okay, good. So yeah, that's a good objection. I want to say a couple of things. So first, uh, there are, like you say, there are cases where we have idealizations in science and we can kind of dispense with the idealization by talking about things like limits, for example. So in the limit that a real gas approaches an ideal gas, it's going to behave in such and such ways. Uh, as Penelope Matty has pointed out though, that doesn't work for all cases of idealization in science. So in fluid dynamics, for example, sometimes or often we will approximate fluids as though they were continuous. Yeah. But real fluids wouldn't even wouldn't even behave the way that these ideal fluids behave if you in the limit of becoming continuous. So that move doesn't always work, and yet we still are willing to accept these explanations in science. And 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 second, I will say if you're willing to accept, and maybe you aren't. But if you're willing to accept that the ostrich Platonist explanation of character, or, or sorry, of the formal properties of exact resemblance works, if you're willing to accept that, then I don't think that you should object to the fictionalist just kind of hijacking that explanation. Because really, it's just like we, we have the things down here on below, so to speak, the things up in Plato's heaven. The things in Plato's heaven are being exemplified by the things down below, but just because of how those things are, the things in Plato's heaven aren't explaining how those things are. But we can see that because uh, the things down here below are suited to stand in these kinds of relations to the things up here, that um, exact intrinsic relation or exact intrinsic resemblance has to have these certain formal features. And so that offers us a kind of explanation for those formal features. Now the fictional just says, okay, right. But what's really doing all like the ontic explanatory work here? It's not really the things up there. It's just the things down below. If you deleted those things, you could still note that these things down below would be suited to stand in those relations. It's just the things up there aren't there anymore for them to stand in those relations. 
But by seeing that they're suited to stand in those relations, we get the same sort of explanation for the, um, the formal features of exact intrinsic resemblance. All right, and so um, I guess we'll just move on to the, to the final argument. This is again from Jeff Brower, and it's basically, he, he's summarizing the medieval philosopher Anselm. Uh, he got, offers an argument from objective comparison among things that resemble one another to various degrees. Um, and so I will just take, you, take the audience and us through what Brower nicely summarizes with respect to this argument. So he says, consider now a degreed kind such as flat things, that is, the class of things that are more or less or equally flat. What must be accounted for in this case, uh, what must be accounted for in, a, in the case of a kind such as this, is not merely the fact that its members objectively resemble in a certain respect, say flat-wise, but also the fact that their resemblance in this respect admits of variation in degree. And unlike mere objective resemblance, it's difficult to see how to account for such degreed resemblance without appealing to something like a platonic form, for such resemblance seems to involve a relation to a common standard or ideal, in this case of perfect flatness. Indeed, it is hard to see what it could even mean to say that one thing is, say, flatter than another, if not that it lives up to the standard or ideal of perfect flatness more fully than the other. But if that's right, that it would seem that resemblance in respect of flatness or any other degreed respect of resemblance just is to be analyzed or explained in terms of a relation to something like a platonic form. The standard realist demand for explanation of mere objective resemblance will have no force against those who either deny that such resemblance requires explanation or else think that it can be explained, at least in part, in terms of something other than universals, for example, tropes. But even such thinkers may still feel the force of Anselm's realist demand for explanation of degreed resemblance. For, as was also just noted, it's hard to see how to make sense of degreed resemblance without appealing to universals. In fact, as our discussion of flat things helps to make clear, to say that two things objectively resemble each other in some respect that admits of variation in degree is apparently just is or apparently just is to say that there exists some third thing, a common standard or ideal, that the original two things approximate to some degree. And if that's right, degree resemblance is something that must be explained in terms of relation to a universal. Now, some, some people in the audience might be thinking, um, hey, when we make comparative judgments about flat things, we're doing so merely with respect to something that exists in the mind, maybe like an idea or a concept of perfect flatness. Uh, what Brower says in response to this is that, um, this suggestion is inconsistent with the common sense assumption taken for granted uh, throughout a lot of people's comparative judgments that um, flat things resemble one another objectively. Like even if there weren't any minds, some things would be flatter than others. Uh, or even if there weren't any minds, some things would be more F than others. And hence that our comparative judgments about them do not depend for their truth on the existence of any mind minded to be beings such as us and our ideas and concepts. Okay, so what do you think about this focus on comparison and how comparison seems to require the existence of a standard, which seems resistant to nominalist analysis? Yeah, I do think that this is an interesting argument. I want to say a couple of things. So first, it isn't clear to me that this is a good argument for the existence of properties as contemporary Platonists conceive of them. I'm, I'm not a Plato, Plato scholar, but according to some such scholars that I've heard, the forms really aren't best thought of as abstract entities, Plato's forms, that is, the historical Plato's forms. They're best thought of as something like paradigmatic examples of things. So if that's how we're supposed to think of them, then the form of flatness would actually be something that's perfectly flat. Uh, and in any case, the argument itself speaks of things that are flat, um, or it speaks of things that are flat to various degrees resembling the form of flatness with respect to being flat. But the property of flatness, as contemporary Platonists think of it, if there is such a thing, presumably it's not flat. It's non-spatio-temporal. And so it can't be resembled in that sort of way. So this is an inter interesting argument for something like the historical Plato's forms, but I don't think it's a it's a really a, a good argument for the existence of abstract objects as conceived of by contemporary Platonists. Okay, but second, you know, what do we do with that? Um, uh, so what do we do with the argument itself? Are we committed to these kinds of strange form like things? Well, I think that the fictionalists can mirror An Anselm's explanation 
without actually pausing that there's a form of perfect flatness. Again, in the, in the manner of ideal gases, what, what matters they might say for things being flat to various degrees is that their character makes them suited to resemble such a form, regardless of whether there actually is one. Yeah, that makes sense. So it's like, it's interesting how you can apply uh, the, the things that we were saying earlier with respect to mere objective resemblance to this kind of degreed case. Mm -hmm. So um, I find that interesting. So we could probably set the one over many arguments aside because we've gone quite long for this. Uh, I really enjoyed it because this is good. I mean, this is historically one of the major motivations. So uh, it's good that we're kind of camping out here and really uh, digging into it. So, but we have to move on and let's move on to arguments that are roughly along the lines of like truth-making and correspondence theory and so on. So um, another argument for realism derives from the truth of subject predicate discourse, right? So we make all sorts of uh, true subject predicate claims. Uh, the cup is red, uh, the horse is fast, snow is white, and so on. But plausibly, uh, sentences can only be true if they appropriately latch on to reality. That is if they like match or correspond with reality. Uh, but Surely it's not merely enough to have the subject of the sentence to refer to something in reality. Surely it's not enough, for instance, merely to have the cup or the horse or the snow in order to account for the truth of the aforementioned sentences that I, that I just said. For we can have the cup or the horse or the snow without those sentences being true, right? The cup might exist, but instead be blue, or the horse might get injured so that it, it's like not fast anymore, or someone might put food coloring in the snow. So it's not enough to explain the truth of subject predicate discourse that we merely have the existence of the referent of the subject term. There must also exist plausibly the referent of the predicate term. That is, there must really exist the thing that the predicate term expresses. And this in turn requires, or at least arguably requires, that properties really exist. Since the only possible candidate for the thing in reality expressed by a predicate term uh, is almost always a property, surely, you know, like snow is white. We're talking about whiteness there. <laughs> That's surely a property. So um, what what do you really make of, of this kind of reasoning? Yeah, so I myself am not much of a fan of truth maker theory. And so I don't really feel much pressure to find truth makers for sentences such as the cup is red. But there are moves that nominalists more friendly to truth maker theory might make here. So one such move is to deny truth maker necessitism, the view that truth makers must necessitate the things that they make true. If you abandon truth maker necessitism, then there's no barrier to saying that the red cup is in fact the truth maker for the, the sentence or the proposition that the cup is red, um, even though it could fail to be the case that the cup is red and that red cup could still exist. It would, would just not be a red cup and under those conditions. Um, still, given that it's there, it's the red cup, truth makers don't need to necessitate the things they make true. It could still make true the claim that the cup is red. I, I, uh, I just have to say, I like, okay. I really like truth maker necessitism, but so I would not want to take sure. that route, but go on, go on. Yeah, sure. I mean, there are ways we haven't really mentioned we haven't really mentioned views like this, like some nominalists might want to deny that there are universals, but say that there are uh, tropes like this particular redness and that, you know, the, the, it could only exist in that cup and that makes it true that the cup is red. Uh, you know, one thing I, I kind of don't like about those views is it seems to me that when I say the cup is red, I'm talking about the cup. I'm not talking about these other kinds of exotic en entities. So it doesn't, it seems to me that the cups being red is that true has it has to do with just you know how the cup is what uh so uh but again I, i'm not that sympathetic to truth maker theory uh but you know in any case i will say this whatever story we tell about the truth of subject predicate statements it can't be generally true that all such discourse is to be explained in this straightforward manner of a subject exemplifying a property that corresponds to the predicate at issue. So uh, as is well known, a view like that leads to a property analog of Russell's paradox for sets. So let's you know, imagine, let's pretend for a moment that there are properties and note that some properties, such as the property of being a property, 
have themselves as properties. The property of being a property is itself a property, so it's self-exemplifying. Other properties, such as the property of being human, do not have themselves as properties. Whatever the property of being human is, it, it's not itself human. So the property of being human is non-self-exemplifying. Now take that sentence I just uttered, the property of being human is non-self-exemplifying. If its truth is to be explained in terms of a subject exemplifying a property that corresponds to the predicate, then there is such a property as being non-self-exemplifying. But now ask yourself this question about that property. Does it exemplify itself? Well, if it does, then it doesn't. If it doesn't, then it does. So we get a contradiction. So there can't be such a property. Now, I'm not saying there are no workarounds for the realist here. So maybe in every instance, every case of true predication is to be explained by things having properties, but not always in terms of things having properties that straightforwardly correspond to those predicates. Or maybe as you suggested in some notes that you sent to me, the fact that being human is non-self-exemplifying could be explained via it's not having the property of being self-exemplifying. Um, I don't have any general argument that no such suggestion could work out, but I do think these considerations undermine any claim on the part of the realist that they just have some nice, simple, generally applicable schema for understanding the truth of all subject predicate discourse. Yeah, that makes sense. So I guess another objection to fictionalist nominalism and in favor of realism um, derives from correspondence theory of truth in conjunction with claims about the only plausible candidates for um, the worldly correlates of sentences or propositions or whatever. Um, that is those bits or portions of reality to which the true sentences or propositions correspond. So um, consider, surely one plus one equals two. Uh, surely triangles have three sides. Surely the interior angles of a triangle sum to 180 degrees. Surely the number two is prime and so on. Uh, how though could these be true unless they correspond with reality? Uh, and how could they correspond with reality unless the number one exists? The plus function exists. The equality relation exists. Uh, triangle Triangles exist. The number two exists and so on, right? If I say two is prime, um, I'm talking about the number two, right? Uh, it's not as though I'm not talking about like classes of two things and, you know, those sorts of things. Uh, and, you know, two would be prime even if there were no such classes and so on. So it seems to, I, I seem to be talking about the number two. Same with like one plus one and so on and triangles. So um, it would seem as though, moreover, that these could only be abstract objects. Like you're not going to bump into the number two in your garage, arguably. Uh, I mean, the number two, the plus function, uh, these sorts of things, these would be abstract objects were they to exist. Um, and so we seem to have here a kind of argument from correspondence theory to uh, the truth of like mathematical Platonism and perhaps other sorts of things. Uh, so what do you make of this argument? Yeah, so I wouldn't treat all the sentences that you mentioned in quite the same way, but to illustrate in general how my fictionalist approach goes, I'll say something kind of shocking. Sometimes I like to say this sort of thing just for the shock value. I think it's strictly speaking false that one plus one equals two. So why? Well, the claim that claim entails the existence of one and the existence of two, but if one and two existed, they'd be numbers and therefore abstract objects. But in my view, there aren't any such things. So it's just false that one plus one equals two. Okay, but that sounds outrageous, right? Isn't it just like some obvious a priori truth that one plus one equals two? I mean, even me, when I've been teaching, when I teach philosophy and I wanna pull out an example of some obvious a priori truth, I might pull out one plus one equals two. Um, but here I think we have to be careful not to conflate the ontologically loaded claim that one plus one equals two with certain obvious logical truths in the neighborhood. So I do think it's strictly speaking true that whenever you have one thing and another thing and no other things besides those, then you've got exactly two things. Uh, I take that to be a nominalistically acceptable logical truth. It doesn't commit me to the existence of things like numbers. Um, and I think in ordinary discourse, which I think includes a lot of loose talk, when people assert that one plus one equals two, they aren't clearly distinguishing between the ontologically loaded mathematical claim at issue and the various nominalistically acceptable logical truths in the neighborhood. 
And finally, as a fictionalist, I believe that there being such logical truths in the, in the neighborhood licenses us as pretending true that one plus one equals two. And so it makes it acceptable for us to assert that claim or at least quasi assert as much. So yeah, there are certain obvious a priori truths right in the neighborhood that make that claim assertable. I think that explains our sense that it's, a, it's an obvious a priori truth. Now we're on to the next set of arguments, which is abstract reference and ontological commitment. So um, basically we seem to make perfectly ordinary claims that firstly, seem to make ineliminable reference to abstract objects, and secondly, seem intuitive, obvious, and or common sense. So um, consider for instance that blue is my favorite color. Now this seems clearly true. Um, if you don't think that I'm lying, I mean, I'm not lying. I, I like the color royal blue. Uh, but it seems to refer to the universal blue, uh, and it's notoriously difficult to paraphrase this away. Uh, that is to accurately and fully capture what I mean and to accurately and fully capture the above sentences truth conditions while making reference only to concrete particulars. Um, for instance, one try uh, to paraphrase this as Joe prefers blue things over non-blue things, like say red things, uh, or perhaps that I prefer blue things to non-blue things, or ceteris paribus or whatever um but maybe i hate blue things i just like the color blue you know suppose that for every red object uh and for every blue object i would pick i would prefer that red object over that blue object despite the fact that i like blue simpliciter over red simpliciter there doesn't seem to be anything incoherent about that and so the paraphrase won't work and uh, other proposed paraphrases notoriously seem to face problems as well. So what do you think about these arguments from abstract reference that we seem to be able to like refer to abstract objects in true sentences, uh, like uh, blue is my favorite color? Yeah, so I wouldn't attempt to paraphrase such sentences away. Instead, I'd say this. So let's let's start with a Platonist picture and suppose that it is strictly speaking true that blue's your favorite color. So let's just start there. If that's the case, then presumably it's in virtue of your having certain intrinsic mental states, whether occurrent or dispositional, that you stand in that sort of relation to the color of blue. So now imagine that we just, we leave you just as you are, but we delete the color blue from the world. It's now strictly speaking false that blue is your favorite color, but you still have those states. And in my view, as a fictionalist, it's your having those states that licenses as pretend true that blue is your favorite color that makes that assertable or, or quasi assertable. All right, so um, now let's just kind of give this a kind of formulation and we can call this a, an easy or flat footed argument. So this argument draws upon again, ordinary language examples of seeming truths that imply or otherwise ontologically commit us to abstract objects. So for instance, we could say premise one, there are some features that Kenny and Joe have in common. That seems to be a perfectly ordinary common sense claim. Therefore, there are some features, right? We just drop by adjective dropping, right? We just drop adjectives. If there are some features that we have in common, well, then obviously there are features. Uh, but if there are some features, well, then arguably there really are some features. They really exist. Um, I personally don't really know what there really are features could mean unless it means that there are features. So I take this to be a kind of logical truth. Um, and therefore it follows that there really are some features. Now, this is importantly different from an argument. Uh, well, this doesn't seem to generalize and because this is relevantly different from an argument that we might run as follows, a kind of parody argument. Oh, premise one, there are some fictional characters that I like, maybe Harry Potter or something like that, you know? Two, therefore there are some fictional characters. Three, if there are some fictional characters, well, then there really are some fictional characters. Therefore, there really are some fictional characters. Um, now, here, I understand that first premise to mean something like there are some false stories that describe character profiles, and I feel positively towards some of those character profiles. So we have a translation here that allows us to exchange talk of concrete characters for talk of abstract profiles. Uh, in the case of and in the case of a translation, I can reject that third premise, like that if there are some fictional characters, well, then there really are some fictional characters, because no, I, I, I translate that, that first thing. I translate that away that doesn't commit me to these fictional entities. Rather, I just have abstract objects. 
But importantly, um, I don't have such a translation with respect to my talk of some of the features that Kenny and Joe have in common. Uh, I'm not talking about like fictional features with, that we have in common, but real ones that we have in common, surely. Um, and of course, other examples that we can use in an easier flat-footed argument. Um, you could say, hey, there's a number between five and seven, <laughs> six. So therefore there are numbers, right? So there's a number. Um, or we could say there are infinitely many primes, right? We could use Euclid, Euclid's proof. Suppose that there are finitely many, multiply them all together, add one. You can prove that that's a further prime number. So um, we actually can show that there are infinitely many prime numbers. And so there are numbers. Um, and now, of course, so anyway, yeah, that's basically the form of um, these kind of flat-footed arguments. We have literally true, simple sentences. And then we say, hey, if those are literally true, well, then um, the objects that their singular terms denote exist. Um, like numbers and things like that. And there are such literally true simple sentences. And so uh, those singular terms, the, the reference of the singular terms exist, but the only plausible reference are abstract objects and hence they exist. So what do you make of that argument? Yeah, so if by literally true simple sentences in this context, we mean simple sentences whose compositionally determined semantic content is true, then I deny that there are literally true simple sentences contain containing singular terms that could only refer to things that could be abstract objects, or that they're literally true existential statements whose quantifiers range over things that could only be abstract objects. What I think, in fact, is that those sentences are, strictly speaking, false. This is what my fictionalist view is actually kind of made for, is that we don't have to accept these sentences as true. We can just accept them as true according to the pretense or pretense worthy. So, you know, I think just to take one of those examples, I think it's strictly speaking false that Joe and Kenny have features in common, but given how things are with us, we both like philosophy, for example, uh, it's the, the, the claim that Joe and Kenny have features in common is licensed by the Platonist fiction. So it becomes quasi assertable. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay, on to a third kind of arguments, mathematical discovery. So. We seem to make like striking discoveries in mathematics, like new proofs and theorems and numbers and functions and relationships and so on. Um, and what we discover moreover seems to be objective, like not dependent on our attitudes or thoughts and so on. And also seems to be necessary. You know, the truths that we discover seem to be unalterable. They couldn't fail to be true. Um, and even if the relevant claims aren't true simpliciter, arguably what we do show, what we do prove is that if certain foundational axioms are true and principles are true and so on, then the relevant mathematical result is true. But if mathematical objects don't exist, well then how do we make these striking discoveries that seem to be about them? Um, wouldn't this be like saying, yes, we make dis striking discoveries about electrons, uh, but by the way, there are no electrons. Um, so how does the fictionalist nominalist kind of engage with this problem or at least potential problem? And so fictions have both explicit content and implicit content. So it's, it's explicitly true in the MCU fiction, for example, that Tony Stark married Pepper Potts. That's explicitly stated. But it's to the best of my knowledge, at least only implicitly true that Tony Stark has a liver. So I don't think that's ever explicitly stated in the fiction, but it's plausibly true according to the fiction nonetheless. So given that fictions have implicit content, we can sometimes make surprising discoveries about their content. And I think that's often what happens in the case of mathematical discovery. So mathematical truths, or really claims that are true according to mathematics, I don't really think they're true, are among other things closed under logical implication. And I think much of mathematical discovery amounts to logical discovery. We're finding out what various other mathematical claims that we already know to be part of the mathematical story imply, and so discovering other things that are true according to the mathematical story. So that was the mathematical discovery argument. And now let's move on to propositions. So I just titled this one Propositions Galore because there are lots of different considerations um, that philosophers appeal to when it comes to propositions. So let's see if my uh, camera can come back on. Let me. So Propositions are roughly, and among other things, as I said at the beginning, bearers of truth value, like either true or false, and they're also what's expressed by declarative sentences. And we'll also be treating them as abstract non-linguistic objects, since we're concerned with arguments for realism about abstracta, after all. So um, some people think that, 
hey, we need propositions in addition to things like statements or sentence inscriptions and utterances, um, because we can consider the following two sentences, snow is white and schnee ist weiss. Uh, these are two different sentences, but they obviously have something in common. Something here is identical in the two cases. And that's the proposition expressed. Without propositions, arguably, we can't make sense of this commonality between them. So what do you make of this argument? Yeah, so I think tokens of snow is white are synonymous with tokens of schnee is spice. Sorry for my pronunciation. But I deny uh, that they express the same proposition because I don't think there are any such things as propositions. But I will grant that the fiction of propositions is a useful one. And so I'm often willing to talk as though they are. They are. But really, I just think you can have sentence tokens that are synonymous, but there is no such thing as the proposition they both express. All right, and um, now let's move on to another kind of propositional argument. And this one is from Anderson and Welty. So in one of their 2011 articles. So basically, a lot of our subject, verb, object type sentences have, or at least seem to have, existential presuppositions. And so a, certain verbs seem to take propositions, such as the laws of logic, as their objects. And they seem to existentially presuppose them. As a general rule, a statement with a subject object verb structure presupposes the existence of both its subject and its object. Right? If I say like Peter kicks the ball, if there's no such thing as the ball, that's surely going to be false. So um, if Peter kicks the ball, we need both Peter and the ball to exist, arguably. Uh, and so if one or the other were non-existent, that statement would be false. Um, but there are numerous verbs, right, which take propositions as their objects, right? Believe no desire hope fear doubt and other propositional attitudes and so such verbs take a sentient subject and a propositional object uh with the word that um and so in general it seems as though we should treat these like the other cases there needs to exist the ball for peter kicks the ball to be true similarly if someone believes that such and such is the case and that's a proposition uh we need to have the proposition to exist as well so um what do you make of this yeah, so Arthur Pryor regarded that clauses that attach to verbs like says or believes or knows as verbial. So if I were to accept Pryor's view, I could accept, for example, that it's strictly speaking true that Joe believes that the earth is the third planet from the sun. But I wouldn't have to think of the phrase that the earth is the third planet from the sun as functioning, referring to an object. I could just think of it as an adverb and that rephrase modifying believes. Now, one problem with that view, though, that, that clauses in sentences like the one I just discussed appear to be subject to existential generalization. So it seems to follow from Joe believes that the Earth is the third planet from the sun, that there's something that Joe believes, or to put it in first order law, that there is an X such that Joe believes X. So it looks like that clause is, since they're subject to existential generalization, it looks like they are functioning grammatically like they do denote objects after all. But I think a fictionalist like me could take Pryor's insight, or they could take up Pryor's insight in the following way. So we could imagine starting out with a language much like English, except that that clauses do in fact function uh, adverbally instead of denoting propositional objects. But then we could realize that it's very useful to talk as though there are such objects as propositions. So we could take you know, the fact that Joe believes that the earth is the third planet from the sunly to bring out the adverbial structure. We could take that to license the pretense that Joe stands in a believing relation to a propositional object denoted by the phrase that the earth is the third planet from the sun. We could incorporate that pretense in our manner of talking, and then we'd have something like that clause is the way they actually function in English. All right. So um, here's another propositional. And I guess I should say, are you good for maybe another 20 minutes? Is that is that okay? Yeah, sure. That's fine. Okay. So um, so here's another argument by philosopher Trenton Merricks. So um, consider the following syllogism. Premise one, if there are sentences, well, then giraffes exist. Uh, conclusion, giraffes exist. Now, uh, surely that's an invalid argument. The conclusion just doesn't follow from the premise, but 
if you try to explain validity of arguments in a way that relies just on sentences, or you know, we can actually modify this to talk about any other contingent things, well, then we get a problem. Because then if premise one is true and a premise is just a sentence or some other contingent thing, well, then it follows that there are sentences, right? Since whatever is true exists, uh, non-existent things after all cannot be anything, let alone be true. So again, premise one is true only if there are sentences. So suppose that premise one is true. Well, then it follows that there are sentences, but then look at premise one. If there are sentences, well, then giraffes exist. So it follows that giraffes exist. <laughs> Therefore, assuming that premise one is true, the conclusion does follow. Uh, and so the argument turns out to be valid. Uh, and that just seems obviously wrong. And so from this, we cannot explain validity. If we want to try to explain it, we can't explain validity in a way that relies just on sentences or any other contingent things. And so we have to treat the premises and conclusions arguably as propositions that exist necessarily and don't just depend on um, contingent mental activity and aren't just sentences or anything like that. So um, what do you make of this kind of argument? I think it's a clever argument, uh, but as a nominalist, I don't see any reason to include arguments in my ontology. So presumably if there were such things as arguments, they would either be something like sequences of propositions or perhaps of interpreted sentence types, but I don't believe in things like that. So as my friend and Andrew Bailey might put it, I propose to solve this problem the way the atheist solves the problem of evil. Um, but, you know, of course, I'm not just going to stop there. Uh, first, I have a ready paraphrase of the claim that the argument you lay out above is invalid. Instead of attributing inv invalidity to the argument, I can simply deny its corresponding strict conditional. That is, instead of saying that the argument, if there are sentences, giraffes exist, there are sentences, therefore giraffes exist, is invalid, I can say instead, it's not the case that necessarily if there are sentences, giraffes exist, and there are in fact sentences, then giraffes exist. I could just deny that corresponding strict conditional. That's my paraphrase of the claim that the argument is invalid. Uh, second, I, I acknowledge, of course, that it's entirely reasonable to talk and reason as though arguments exist. We've been doing it, I've been doing it, and that they have properties such as being valid, invalid, et cetera. But then I'll take my usual fictionalist sort of approach to that kind of talk. All right. So uh, another argument, I know we're doing rapid fire arguments, but I want to try to get through at least this section uh, before finishing. So um, another argument is developed by Josh Rasmussen for the necessary existence of propositions. Uh, I believe it's in his article published in uh, what is it? The Polish Journal of Philosophy. It's called From Necessary Truth to Necessary Existence. So he's arguing for Platonism about, or version of Platonism about abstract propositions uh, from their necessary truth. So the basic idea is that, um, hey, there are some things arguably that are necessarily true. Uh, torturing babies for fun is wrong. Um, and so uh, let's just call that, let's call that a proposition. We don't have to ontologically commit yet to, to propositions, but um, it cannot fail to be true. It's necessarily true. It's necessarily true that torturing babies for fun is wrong. But uh, the question is how could something be necessarily true if it doesn't necessarily exist, right? I mean, in order for something to be anything, right? In order for it to be true, in order for it to be read, it must be, it must be there in the first place, right? If they don't even exist in the first place, so as to be anything, well, then clearly they don't exist so as to be true. And so since this proposition is true in all possible worlds, it must be in all possible worlds. It must exist in all possible worlds. Uh, and so we get a kind of argument for a necessarily existing abstract object. So what do you kind of think of this argument from necessity? I, I've simplified it. So Josh, if you're watching, I apologize. So it's a simplification. So don't, don't yell at me. Um, but yeah, what do, you what do you make of that argument? Well, I accept that necessarily torturing babies for just for fun is wrong. But here in that sentence I just used, I take the, the necessarily to function as a sentence operator not as a predicate of anything. I'm not predicating necessary truth of any proposition. I'm just saying necessarily torturing babies just for fun is wrong. I think as anomalous, I can endorse that as strictly speaking true. Um, I don't think endorsing that sentence ontologically commits me to anything actually. Um, I do deny though that it is a necessary truth that torturing babies just for fun is wrong. Since if there were such things as necessary truths, they would be propositions, and I don't believe in those. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, another argument from Josh Rasmussen, um, 
other people have developed this argument as well, but he, in his book, The Correspondence, Defending the Correspondence Theory of Truth, he develops an argument from um, communication. And this isn't exactly Josh's formulation and so on. And a lot of other thinkers have pushed it. And so I'm just giving a kind of generic rundown. Um, so yeah. Now, when you and I entertain something like a truth, the Pythagorean theorem say, um, we seem to be entertaining one and the same thing, which refers to one and the same proposition, arguably. I mean, it's not like you're thinking about your own personal Pythagorean theorem and I'm thinking about mine or whatever. Uh, and moreover, many of the propositions we entertain are the same as those entertained by people long dead, and people in the future and so on. And, you know, it, they can't be like mere particular thinking events or tokens or whatever in my own mind or yours, because they seem to be shared in common. There's, we're entertaining one and the same thing here. Um, and consider also what at least seems to be, consider what at least seems must be the case in order for communication to be possible. Um, suppose that the universals and propositions or whatever that you entertain are not shareable. Suppose that they're non-shareable particulars, perhaps like mental events or mental items or concrete mental objects of some kind, uh, maybe brain states or whatever. Um, well, then it would be impossible for you and anyone else ever to communicate. For whenever you said something like snow is white, say, well, then the universals or whatever that you refer to and the propositions that you expressed would be things that existed only in your own mind and would thus be inaccessible to anybody else. Your idea of snow would be different from my idea of snow, since your idea is that you only have access to that. And I only have access to mine. These are only just particular mental things. We would never be able to mean the exact same thing whenever we talked about snow or anything else for that matter. Um, but surely that's absurd, right? We are able to communicate. There seems to be one and the same thing here in both of our minds that say, we need something that's shareable, maybe a proposition. Um, and similarly for concepts, we need something that's shareable, like universals that we're latching onto, say, in order to be able to communicate. If communication presupposes some, some shared framework, uh, and these you can't make sense of that shareability, as it were, uh, if you only have particulars in your ontology. That's kind of how the argument basically or roughly goes. So what do you think about that? Yeah, so this might initially sound like a stubborn, flat-footed sort of response, but I think it's strictly speaking false that you and I ever entertain or say anything, because the objects of entertaining or saying, if there, if, if there were such objects, I agree would be propositional objects, but I don't believe that such things exist. Now, I, I do believe that we entertain and that we say, and following Arthur Pryor again, we can introduce adverbial phrases to modify such verbs. So I think that you and I can both entertain Pythagorean theoremly, for instance, or both say that snow is whitely, um, but the phrases entertain Pythagorean theoremly or say snow is whitely here are in these sentences functioning as monadic predicates, not as relational ascriptions. So all they require, uh, all, they re all they demand ontologically is that they have a subject to apply to, namely me and you. And now let's just um, go on to indispensability and these kinds of theoretical utility arguments. So, um, you know, a lot of arguments for realism focus on the indispensability and theoretical utility of abstract objects like mathematical objects, especially in science. And so we have the Quine put them indispensability argument, for instance, like premise one, we should commit to the existence of those entities that are indispensable to our best scientific theories, like we can't formulate them without mathematics and so on. Uh, secondly, mathematical entities are indeed indispensable to our best scientific theories, so we should commit to the existence of mathematical entities. Uh, so yeah, well, as Putnam put it, um, denying realism about mathematical objects while accepting science would be like, quote, trying to maintain that God does not exist and angels do not exist while maintaining at the very same time that it is an objective fact that God has put an angel in charge of each star, end quote. And um, Eric Steinhardt also puts it, um, interestingly, he says, scientific theories refer to physical things, and all the evidence for those scientific theories is evidence that those things exist. Um, and there is indeed lots of evidence for those things. But those scientific theories also refer to mathematical objects like numbers and functions and vectors and Hilbert spaces and so on. Uh, and it's not possible to rewrite our best scientific theories in ways that kind of eliminate reference to these mathematical objects. Uh, and so all the evidence for those scientific theories, just like in the case of the physical objects, is evidence for those mathematical objects. So um, what do you make of these kind of indispensability arguments? Yeah, so I actually have a lot to say about these arguments as 
as of now, all of my published work defending nominalism is devoted to these sorts of arguments. It's like chapter one of my dissertation, maybe eventually I'll get to writing about chapter two. But <laughs> first, uh, you know, I just want to observe, I, I want to be succinct as I can here, but I just want to observe that these arguments are only going to be moving to those who are disposed to accept some sort of scientific realism where this at least includes believing in the concrete unobservable entities postulated by our best scientific theories. Things like quarks, electrons, atoms, things that we can't observe with our unaided powers, often referred to in the literature as unobservables. Um, so you know, those who don't think that the evidence supporting our best scientific theories gives us strong reason even to believe in atoms are not going to think that the evidence in favor of those theories gives us good reason to believe in things like numbers. So the challenge here really is to nominalists who, like me, are disposed to accept some form of scientific realism uh, to explain how it is that they're being epistemically consistent in believing in things like quarks, but denying the existence of numbers, even though both seem to be implied by our best scientific theories. So that's one observation. Uh, second, Though, as Elliot Sober has pointed out, a lot of these sorts of arguments seem to explicitly commit to or presuppose a false principle of confirmation known as the special consequence condition. So according to that principle, if E is evidence for some hypothesis H and H logically implies C, then E is evidence for C. But that's false. There are some easy counterexamples. So say my hypothesis is that the fair coin that I know was recently tossed 10 times came up heads all 10 times. And I learned that the first time it did indeed come up heads. That's some evidence for my hypothesis. It raises its probability. And that hypothesis implies that the second flip came up heads. But that evidence is no evidence at all that the second flip came up heads because the flips are causally or they're probabilistically independent of each other. So Likewise, we could agree that we have a lot of empirical evidence for our best scientific theories, and that those theories imply the existence of mathematical entities, even while denying that that empirical evidence is evidence for the existence of those mathematical entities. Now, third, there's a really important difference between mathematical entities and concrete unobservables, namely that concrete unobservables are causal so we should expect that if there are quarks, we would see certain kinds of phenomena precisely because we should expect quarks to cause certain kinds of phenomena. But since mathematical entities are a puzzle, if they exist at all, we shouldn't expect there to be any difference in the empirical phenomena we observe if mathematical entities exist. So if we put all of these pieces together, I think one can be a principled realist about the existence of the concrete unobservables postulated by our best scientific theories, while denying that there are the mathematical entities whose existence seems to be implied by those theories. In fact, I think you can go farther if you want to and say that our best scientific theories are nominalistically adequate, that everything they say about the intrinsic character of the concrete world is true, even if what they say about the abstract realm is false. Yeah. Okay, so let's now move on to, um, I'm going to skip down to the fact that scientists seem to explain and like unify all different sorts of phenomena by appeal to things like types and features and patterns, and all other sorts of things that seem to demand a kind of realist rather than nominalist construal, right? Evolutionary explanations are in part so powerful because they unify diverse phenomena under a single pattern of explanation that appeals to like universals, like selection pressures, survival, reproduction, genetic mutations, fitness, predator, and so on. Um, and, you know, similar things can be said, uh, arguably, about mathematics, right? Mathematics is astonishingly effective in physics and science more generally, but if mathematical objects don't exist, well, then you'd expect the theories about them to be false. And if those are false, well, then the, expect, then the equations used in science are false. And if those equations are false, well, then we wouldn't really expect that the technologies based on those equations would work, but of course they do work. Uh, and thus we have reason to believe that uh, the scientific explanations, or the, excuse me, that the scientific equations are true, and then the, hence the mathematical theories are true, and hence that the mathematical objects exist. So how do you navigate these kinds of arguments? Yeah, so I agree that, you know, science unifies, um, that it unifies a lot of phenomena by appealing to universal generalizations. But I don't think that by itself is a problem for 
the nominalist, because nominalists can accept universal generalizations without believing in universals. I can believe that all humans are mortal without believing in humanity or mortality. But I'm not going to press that point too far because I think it's true that science is a wash in talk of abstract entities, uh, particularly mathematical entities, but also some others. Um, but I don't know if I have a lot more to say about that, those kinds of arguments than what I've already said about indispensability arguments, except maybe this, maybe something that was added in some of the things that you said is that there might be some pressure on the nominalist to explain why abstract entities turns out to be so useful for science. There's the, uh, there's what the physicist uh, Eugene Bigner called, for example, the unreasonable effectiveness of mathematics and natural science. You know, if the mathematical claims invoked by our best scientific theories are false, then why do those claims nevertheless turn out to be so useful for science? And, you know, by way of response, I say there's mystery either way, but I actually think the mathematical fictionalist does slightly better at accounting for the mystery. So suppose mathematical Platonism is true, well, then what is, what is what's going on in this a-causal realm of abstract objects have anything to do with the phenomena down below on Earth, you know, or in the physical realm? You know, what does Plato's heaven have to do with the things of, of Earth or the physical realm? Uh, it's, it's, it's mysterious that they, they'd have anything at all to do with each other. Uh, I think given fictionalism, it's a little less mysterious because the fictionalist can say that we made mathematics in part to help us understand what's going on in the physical realm. Although I don't think that explanation takes us very far either. Nature is strangely and surprisingly amenable to mathematical description. Uh, and I think, you know, Platonists, everybody has, uh, has a hard time accounting for that. I think it's especially hard for metaphysical naturalists to account for that, whether they're Platonists or not. Um, I think theists like me, Platonists or not, have a bit of an easier time so we can believe that God created the world according to a mathematical template. And that's why it's amenable to mathematical description. And I know that William Lane Craig recently has, who's also a nominalist, has leveraged this, uh, this uh, thought into yet another consideration in favor of the existence of God. And I'm on board with that. All right. So just we're skipping, we're skipping some, just two final things, and these will only be like five minutes long. So the first one is going to be the self-defeat argument, and the second one is just going to be the preservation of according to the fiction. So those are the last two ones that we'll cover, and I'll streamline the presentation of them. So the argument from self-defeat, um, at least in general, it seems notoriously very difficult to defend nominalism in a way that doesn't surreptitiously bring in through the back door a commitment to universals or other abstract objects, in which case the view seems self-undermining. Um, and the same seems to hold true of fictionalist nominalism in particular, right? Fictionalists seem unable to state their views without appealing to things like fictions uh, and discourses and so on uh, that they explicitly reject, um, you know? And surely we should reject a view which, when stated, affirms something that it explicitly denies. So what do you, what's your take on this kind of problem? Yeah, so I was really hoping that for the sake of time, you'd skip this one, <laughs> because I think it's the most forceful objection to my view. Uh, but I want to say this, that remember the way I characterize fictionalism, the fictionalist grants to the Platonist that uh, talk as though there are abstract entities is in fact indispensable for practical and theoretical purposes but that the reason we're forced to engage in such talk has to do with our own cognitive and linguistic limitations. And because that's the case, the fact that we're forced to engage in such talk does not, it's not itself a good reason to commit ourselves to the entities in question. So it's not surprising given that sort of concession, which is not merely from my perspective, a dialectical concession is something I think is actually true. It's not surprising given that claim that even in the context of stating and defending my own fictionalist view, I'll find myself forced to talk as though there are abstract objects in order to the view. So I think one who holds a fictionalist view like mine can consistently acknowledge that even for the purposes of stating their own view, they have to talk as though there are, are abstract entities. But remember, 
we also assert that uh, we don't actually need to commit ourselves to the existence of those entities in order to talk that way. Okay, so uh, here's the final argument that we'll consider, uh, and you've been very generous with your time, so I deeply thank you. And of course, I would love to camp out on the, what you just said there, because, you know, some, I know some, some realists, some of my friends are in their seats, and, you know, maybe they're cursing at their, their screens right now. They're like, you can't do that, or, you know, things like that. But, uh, you know, we're just gonna have to set that aside. Um, yeah, anyway, be kind people, uh, all the realists in the comment section, no. The final one is the, the preservation of according to the fiction. So uh, another problem that people, you know, bring up that's distinctive, arguably distinctive to fictionalism concerns how the phrase, you know, according to mathematical fiction is preserved throughout processes of reasoning, such as the process of calculating whether a bridge will stand instead of collapsing, right? Because that, that calculation, you're going to need equations, you're going to need to refer to the number one and two and three and so on. Um, so, but, but all those, according to the fictionalist, should be given a reading something along the lines of, well, according to the mathematical fiction, you know, one, one plus one equals two and so on. Um, but strictly speaking, it's false. But so importantly, though, in order for these kinds of rules of inference and so on that you're applying to be uh, truth preserving, you need to preserve that operator at the front according to the mathematical fiction. So then what you're going to have to have, the only conclusion that you can draw is that by fictionalism's own lights, the conclusion that you have to draw here from this chain of reasoning is only that according to the mathematical fiction, the bridge will stand, right? Suppose that that's what we have to calculate. We want the bridge to stand, but all we can say is that according to that fiction, the bridge will stand. But surely, surely we want to know whether the bridge will stand simpliciter, right? So how do you navigate this problem as a fictionalist? Right, so in order to be useful, the Platonist fictions do have to employ, or they do have to have a certain property. Uh, that is in the neighborhood of what Hartree Field calls being conservative. And I'm going to say in the neighborhood here because the characterization of conservative that I'm about to give you is not equivalent to his. Um, but what you want is for the fictions to be such that when ever some nominalistically acceptable claim is true according to the fiction, then it's also just true. And if you could have a guarantee of that, then you could be assured that whenever you reason correctly from claims true within the fiction to the claim that the bridge will stand up, that it is in fact true that the bridge will stand up. And it turns out that as long as the Platonist fiction is consistent, closed under logical consequence, and such that any claim that is solely about the concrete world is stipulated to be true according to it, then it will in fact turn out to be conservative in that way. All right. So that's going to have to do it for all the different objections and so on that we're going through. But there's a decent chance that uh, for the audience, we created a, a really helpful uh, document. There's a decent chance that I might be able to put that in the description. So be on the lookout. Uh, I'll talk with Kenny about that. Just in conclusion, we might just want to mention a few book recommendations for the audience um, on this. And then, uh, then we'll uh, say goodbye. So if you could, yeah, okay. just take us through maybe perhaps some um, important papers or books that the audience can, can think about here. Yeah, so let me give you some paper suggestion first. So Joseph Milia's On What There Isn't is a good paper. David Lewis's New, Year, New Work for a Theory of Universals. Peter Van Inwagen's A Theory of Properties. Maddie Eklund's Fictionalism, Indifference, and Ontology. And Stephen Yablo's Go Figure are all good papers. I'm sure I've left some out, but... Uh, I mean, I know I've left many out, but those are some good ones. Uh, some books, uh, Mark Bolliger's Platonism and Anti-Realism in Mathematics, Hartree Field's Mathematics Without Numbers, Mary Lang's Realism and Anti-Realism in Mathematics. That's, a, that's highly recommended. It summarizes a lot of the, or summarizes the other two books I mentioned, gives a great overview of the, of the whole discourse over mathematical fictionalism. Um, I'd also recommend Arthur Pryor's Objects of Thought, David Armstrong's The World of States of Affairs, uh, William Lane Craig's God Overall. Uh, I disagree with Craig on some issues in meta-ontology and theology, but I think it's an excellent overview of issues and defenses of nominalism from a Christian perspective. Yeah, and that, that's also something that I want to point out, like, um, you know, just as there are very able 
intelligent philosophers on the realist side. There are very able and intelligent philosophers on the anti-realist side, including many Christians. There are Christians on both sides. There are atheists on both sides. There are naturalists on both sides and so on. So a lot of the naturalists, for instance, were, um, you know, really big on these indispensability arguments, uh, for instance. So uh, for like mathematical Platonism. So yeah, anyway, that that's going to have to that's going to have to do it. Uh, one of my recommendations is definitely to um, for the audience is to check out my playlist on abstract God and abstract objects. That's where I have um, my discussion with like Scott Berman, my video on the um, Augustinian proof and um, Anderson and Welty's argument from logic. Uh, I have um, my discussion with Felipe Leon in there and other sorts of things. So for the audience, check that out and check out my other playlist. Um, Anyway, if you see value in the work that I do, consider supporting me on uh, Patreon or becoming, you know, or doing a one-time donation. I'm a lowly college student, so you're unironically helping me pay my uh, student debt. So uh, thank you to all my uh, patrons. Um, and yeah, Kenny, thank you so much for coming on and being generous with your time. That was, that was wonderful. So thank you for that. Thank you. It was fun. Yeah. All right. So um, what better way to end is there than I'm Joe Schmidt. This is the Majesty of Reason and peace out.